What's happening with the ERA in 2022? Before we get started, allow me to introduce you to who the ERA NC Alliance is. Now, we're a lead organization of the National ERA Coalition. We're nonpartisan, nonprofit, and we've been around since 2016. We're comprised of 13 North Carolina lead organizations, as you can see on the right side of the slide. Our mission is to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment in North Carolina and ensure that the ERA is in the U.S. Constitution. We're a grassroots movement. We work with local governments and do state actions such as ratification bills in the NCGA and resolutions. So the ERA text, you know, a 2020 Pew Research study found that the majority, over 78% of Americans favor adding the ERA to the constitution. Every democracy's constitution since the end of World War II includes some type of affirmation of equality between the sexes. And you know, the text of the ERA is deceptively simple. Remember, when the framers of the Constitution crafted it in 1787, they purposely left out two groups of Americans, enslaved African-Americans and women. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments attempted to rectify that problem for Black men, but it took another 52 years for women to even have the vote. Women truly are the stepchildren of the ERA. So we look briefly at the history of the ERA. It's been almost a hundred years since Alice Paul first wrote the draft of the ERA. In 1972, finally, the amendment passed both houses of Congress and as a reminder, bipartisan. In fact, the Republicans added it to their platform before the Democrats did. And a new ERA has been introduced in Congress every year since 1983. The first three-year strategy was introduced in the House in 1994 because what fired up these efforts was the Madison Amendment passed. This was the 27th Amendment after 203 years. So in 2011, the House drafted a bill to remove the time limit. And in, 27, uh, in 2012, the Senate did the same. So the House's approval of this resolution to remove the time limit for the ERA has passed in 2020, in 21, and in 22. And it reflects not only its judgment that the time limit is not immutable, but it also is a recognition that for a broad and fundamental principle, like the one reflected in the ERA, no time limit is appropriate. Lots of people say, well, gosh, do we still need an ERA? Well, absolutely. As the late Justice Antonin Scalia said, the Constitution doesn't require discrimination on the basis of sex. The only issue is whether it prohibits it and it doesn't. Remember, 14th Amendment affirmed citizenship of all persons born in the U.S., but it guaranteed political representation only to male citizens 21 years of age. And there have been sex discrimination cases tried using the 14th Amendment, but you're only likely to get a favorable ruling about 50% of the time. We'll talk a little bit more on this later. And as the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, if I could choose just one amendment to add to the Constitution, it would be the Equal Rights Amendment. She was a fervent supporter of the ERA. That, did you know there's 25 states that have an equal rights amendment in their constitution that provides either inclusive or partial equal rights? Can you guess which states? Uh, you might be surprised. States guarantee equal rights on the basis of sex in, a, in various ways. And all of these states that have that red check mark have some type of ERA. Some like Utah and Wyoming entered the union in the 1890s with constitutions that affirmed the equal rights for male and female citizens. Others like Colorado and Hawaii amended their constitutions in the 70s with language about the same as the national ERA. And some like Florida, New Jersey have language in their state constitution that either implicitly or explicitly includes both males and females. What's interesting is that there are three states that have state level 
ERAs, but that never ratified the Equal Rights Amendment nationally. Federal, uh, that would be Florida, Louisiana, and Utah. And what we know is the success of some state ERAs in eliminating discriminatory laws is strong proof that a federal ERA would have real world impact. So it's 2022. Why do we need the ERA? 70% of America's poor are women with children, and that number is increasing. Women make up half the workforce as of January 2020. And sadly, during the pandemic, millions of women lost their jobs or could not continue to work because of issues related to child care. Women are twice as likely as men to retire in poverty. Sexual assault cases and domestic violence cases aren't prosecuted at the same level as even simple robbery. According to the U.S. Census Bureau data of the 38 million people living in poverty in 2018, 56% or 21, almost 21 and a half million were women. And beginning at the age of five, the poverty rate is higher among women than men over the course of their lifetimes. Again, so why do we need an ERA? Well, it would clarify the legal status of sex discrimination for the courts. It would make sex a suspect classification like race, religion, and national origin. And again, reminding only right guaranteed to women in the US Constitution is the right to vote. Now let's talk about the laws that are in place right now. There are laws that provide protection from discrimination for women in schools and employment during pregnancy and many other walks of life, but it's a patchwork. They're not comprehensive in their scope or their application. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act is limited to workplace with 15 or more employees. So you work for a small business, you're out of luck. Title IX, which addresses discrimination in education, only applies to institutions that receive federal funding, not to private schools. And the failure for years to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act and the Me Too movement, if that doesn't tell us that women need further protection under the law, I'm not sure what might move the needle. When the Violence Against Women Act was originally uh, passed, it contained a provision to allow women to sue the accused in federal court. But in 2000, in U.S. versus Morrison, the Supreme Court struck down that section of the Violence Against Women Act, allowing women to sue, saying it exceeded the government's powers, according to the, co the uh, Commerce Clause, and that according to the 14th Amendment, the states must provide the remedy, not the federal government. So Congress had a great idea, and they intended for women to obtain protection through the 14th Amendment for VAWA, but the court struck it down. The ERA would provide a constitutional basis for claims of gender violence. There are a number of cases, and I'm just going to highlight one. In 2000, the Supreme Court struck down the provision of the Violence Against Women Act that had enabled college freshman Christy Brunskala to bring a case against varsity football players who raped her. The Supreme Court held that kind of case didn't fall within the scope of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. And so there was no constitutional basis for the law. The ERA would help set more realistic legal standards for sex discrimination, including equal pay at work. So let's go back a few years to 2011. The Supreme Court ruled against Betty Dukes in the Walmart case noting that even if statistics established a pattern of lower pay and slower promotion in every one of Walmart's 3,400 stores, wouldn't be enough to justify a class action by women who worked at Walmart unless there was an express policy of discrimination. So lower salaries, lesser advancement by women across the country resulting from these discretionary manager employment decisions and the so-called Walmart way um, were found to be beyond the reach of the courts. In 1982, Lola Kuba lost her case against Allstate Insurance Company. She and her colleagues doing the exact same job, but her guaranteed minimum salary was only $8.25 a week, while theirs was $1,000 a week. Allstate argued successfully 
that it wasn't discriminatory to pay her less because she'd been earning less in her prior job. Her lower prior salary was found by the court to be a factor other than sex. One of the exceptions of the Equal Pay Act and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which protect wage discrimination. The ERA could help ensure that women can work safely while pregnant. Now, constitutional jurisprudence guaranteeing equal protection of the laws has expressly rejected protection of pregnant women from sex discrimination. They've held that discrimination against pregnancy isn't discrimination on the basis of sex under the 14th Amendment. Now, Title VII was amended to cover pregnancy in employment settings, but it doesn't require employers to provide minor workplace accommodations needed by pregnant employees. And it's legislation that can be revoked at any time. Number of examples over the years, but here's one. Peggy Young was forced out of work by UPS during her pregnancy. UPS wasn't legally required to reassign her temporarily to a job that didn't require heavy lifting in the same way that they're legally required to temporarily reassign workers who injure their back, for instance. UPS even routinely offers its drivers who lose their licenses due to drunk driving temporary reassignment to jobs that don't involve driving. So the ERA would help require employers make reasonable accommodations for pregnant women in the workplace. And remember, that the ERA would have obligated companies like Hobby Lobby to consider the discriminatory impact of their claim to religious freedom to not cover birth control on the women in their company. Religious rights received strict scrutiny versus women's rights. And finally, the ERA would actually establish the United States as a leader in women's rights. But there are some objections to the ERA. A big one is this idea of enshrining abortion in the US Constitution. It's not going to require government to allow abortion on demand, and it actually misrepresents the existing federal and state laws and the court decisions. All of those were based primarily on due process and the right to privacy. In some states that have state ERAs on their books, they also have strict anti-abortion laws. Frankly, we do not know the impact of the ERA on abortion in this country. Now the deadlines passed, the amendments dead. Well, again, the three state strategy, which we succeeded with when we had Nevada, Illinois and Virginia ratify was developed after the 92 ratification of the 27th amendment more than 203 years after its passage. After the 38th state approved that amendment, the Speaker of the House considered challenging the validity of this unusually long ratification process, but changed his mind when he saw how popular it was. It was actually pay raises for Congress. Archivists certified the ratification and a day later, Congress passed a bill declaring the ratification valid, affirming political acceptance of the process. Remember this because I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. There's also the argument that the 14th Amendment protects women. And I think as we've covered that earlier, it simply is not so. But it was used by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and others as sort of an initial start. Um, truly that the precedent with the 14th and 15th Amendments shows that constitutional originals like Scalia, they really have concluded 14th Amendment has never banned sex discrimination. Um, it affirms the citizenship of all persons, but this is the first place in the Constitution to really specifically spell out male. Um, and SCOTUS has said employers uh, have to show intentions to discriminate. That's a tricky thing to show sometimes when there's a long pervasive pattern of it. We have enough laws on the books to protect women. Well, this is an argument that's being used today and has been used for a long time. So from the Violence Against Women Act, which just was recently renewed to the Lilly Ledbetter Pay Act, laws are overturned. They're not renewed by hostile or neglectful legislatures. Without a bedrock foundation of equality in the US Constitution, plaintiffs simply cannot seek redress in federal courts. 
and they apply a lesser standard when it comes to discrimination against women than they do discrimination against African Americans. The rest of the story, you know, when the ERA was on a trajectory to be approved by enough states to amend the Constitution back in the late 70s, the anti ERA movement really went after Southern white women because the Southern states were the states where they thought the ERA would have the best chance for failing. They're the same states that didn't ratify the 19th Amendment for women's suffrage. So if you're a strategist for an anti ERA group and you're going, hmm, where might we kill this thing? You're looking at places where the 19th Amendment wouldn't pass in 1920. And they really mis misrepresented the ERA to Southern women. Um, they were politicized by this anti-feminist movement by Phyllis Schlafly and other movements to portray feminism and equality as a threat to traditional gender roles. Sadly, the beat goes on. We get asked questions about how the ERA would protect the LGBTQ community. You know, the application of laws prohibiting sex discrimination to situations of discrimination based on sexuality, it's, it's evolving. Discrimination on the basis of sexuality has not traditionally been treated by the courts as a form of sex-based discrimination protected by the Equal Rights Guarantee. What we do know is that federal and state laws, court decisions have rapidly evolved over the past several decades to legalize same-sex marriage and advance LGBTQ rights, primarily on equal protection and individual liberty. The ERA is intersectional. It would ensure that gender equity is forever included in the US Constitution, regardless of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation. Why does it seem that only Democrats are supporting the ERA? The Republican Party, which is about 90% male, sadly does not view the ERA as a priority. And since many religious groups oppose it because they believe it is harmful to the family unit and will enshrine abortion in the Constitution, there are Republicans aligned with that goal. There are, however, some Republicans, such as Senator Lisa Murkowski, who have been strong proponents of the bill. Our challenge is to dispel misinformation around the ERA with our Republican colleagues. So let's talk a little bit about some of the legal challenges and legislation. I'm just going to give you a very brief history of court proceedings over the last couple of years. So in 2020, Equal Means Equal filed a written appeal to the Supreme Court after a federal trial court in Boston dismissed their lawsuit for lack of standing. Now, Supreme Court denied this unusual direct petition, which would have sort of leapfrogged the whole U.S. appeals court. EME then filed their appeal with the first U.S. Circuit Court in Boston. On March 5th of 21, attorney Wendy Murphy argued before that first Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston that the ERA was ratified by 38 states in January of 2020. But the U.S. Arch archivist refused to publish it as the 28th Amendment violating the law. The DOJ attorney, Department of Justice attorney, argued against the lawsuit and that publication of the ERA doesn't matter. He acknowledged that uh, he submitted Judge Contreras' opinion from the AG case to the First Circuit judges as additional authority for the government's position against the ERA in the EME case. Basically, the case was dismissed for lack of standing and the fact that in judges' mind, the deadline has passed. Now, on February 6th, uh, 5th, sorry, the federal, federal district court in DC dismissed the attorney general's lawsuit. These were the attorney generals for Illinois, Nevada, and Virginia, with several other attorney generals, such as our own Josh Stein signing on. And the reason was given that the vote in Illinois, Nevada, and Virginia came after the both original and extended deadlines that Congress attached. And lack of standing is another big one. The case was dismissed. So the attorney generals are appealing this and there have been a host of amici briefs that have been filed. Uh, the ERA NC Alliance has signed on and we are hoping to see these court proceedings held uh, probably in second quarter of 2022. And we will definitely let everyone know uh, when that moves forward. 
There were a number of amici that were filed, as you can see. And again, in 2022, another amici was filed for all of the women's organizations. But there were a huge number of businesses, mayors, constitutional law professors, and a large number of youth organizations. So again, 80% of the population favors the Equal Rights Amendment. And you can see this in the amici briefs. Legislation, so 2021 that has moved into 2022, the Senate and House bills, um, there are two bills to remove the time limit. Um, ben Cardin and Lisa Murkowski are in the uh, Senate bill, SJR1, which has not been heard and is still sitting. Uh, and then in the House of Representatives, uh, Representative Jackie Speer and Tom Reed and 209 co-sponsors reintroduced this joint resolution, HJR 17. The House voted to remove that time limit and again in 2022. So the U.S. House of Representatives has removed the time limit. In North Carolina, once again, we filed bills to ratify the ERA. All of our North Carolina General Assembly Democrats signed on and literally the same day, those bills went into the Rules Committee for both houses. They can still be heard in 2022 in the short session under these same bill laws. But frankly, at the moment, we're not overly optimistic. And in 2021 in the House, Congresswoman Carol Maloney and Tom Reed announced the introduction of H.J. Res 28. And that would be a brand new Equal Rights Amendment. So that gives you a little bit of an idea that this has, uh, there's been a lot of work going on and is still ongoing. Now, what's been happening since January of this year? Um, so as a quick reminder, all the blue states ratified by the deadline, purple states ratified after the deadline, and we've got five states that have voted to rescind or withdraw the ratification. Nebraska, Tennessee, Idaho, Kentucky, and South Dakota. Uh, by the way, rescind, rescissions of an amendment are not legal. And there's nothing in Article 5 of the Constitution that allows this. So we feel like this is more posturing um, that's going on. So what are our efforts now? Uh, we're going to be pressuring the Department of Justice and the Biden administration to clear the way for the National Archives to publish in the Federal Register. We are urging our senators to pass Senate Joint Resolution 1, just like they passed HJR 17 in the House, clarifying that the ERA has met all the requirements of Article 5. We're still hoping that we'll see this in Q1 or in early Q2. In addition, based on urging by President Biden, um, HJ Res 891 is a resolution to recognize the ERA as valid. If you will recall, this is what they did for the 27th Amendment 203 years after it was first proposed and then ratified. And we would ask the Senate to also do a resolution very similar. And the National ERA Coalition is making an effort to examine all state laws, statutes, and regulations that would comply with the ERA. We'll have more about that later in North Carolina. This is House Resolution 891, just expressing the sense that the Article of Amendment is valid. We, live, we have this expression that right now, as of March of 2022, the ERA is very much like Schrodinger's cat. For those of you who took physics, in quantum mechanics, Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment that illustrates the paradox of quantum superposition. It's a thought experiment. So a hypothetical cat could be considered simultaneously both alive and dead. Let's say you put some poison in the box because its fate is sort of linked to a random event. So you don't know until you open up that box whether the cat is alive or dead because it's really both. So although the efforts to clarify the 28th Amendment's validity are not necessary, they're also being pursued to remove any ambiguity as to the status of its ratification. And here's why. Okay. 
because the ERA has satisfied all the requirements set forth in Article 5. The ERA requires a two-year waiting period to go into effect. That was January 27th of 2022. 2020, Virginia became the 38th and final state needed to ratify. The ERA is now fully enforceable. President Biden called on Congress to pass a resolution recognizing the ERA, which they have done. National statewide events were held celebrating the ERA and those 58 words that would be added and the OLC, Office of Legal Counsel, released a new memo saying that the Trump memo from Attorney General Barr is not an obstacle either to Congress's ability to act with respect to ratification or to judicial consideration of questions regarding the constitutional status of the ERA. Again, arguments for and against recognizing it. For we've met the requirements set out in Article 5. There is nothing in Article 5 about time limits. States vote on the amendment. The time limit was in the preamble only. No state's allowed to rescind the ratification. Publication is just a legal technicality. And the archivist has no authority. He's the nation's librarian not to publish. That is his ministerial duty. Now, the people on the other side are saying, whoa, whoa. The ERA had a seven-year deadline. I mean, we extended it once. It's expired. Article 5 gives powers to Congress to set deadlines. Five states rescinded. No state should be able to ratify after a deadline has expired, but never mind about the 27th Amendment. We're not going to talk about that. Ratification should be contemporaneous, but never mind the 27th Amendment that was ratified 203 years later. And Attorney General Barr's Office of Legal Counsel issued an opinion that the ERA isn't valid. So what are we doing in North Carolina? Well, we have been working closely with the international law firm Winston and Strong. And we have begun to examine all the North Carolina laws, regulations, and statutes. Over 47,000 pages of laws were reviewed with only 2,000 pages that were found with laws and regulations that were gender neutral. 70 lawyers with over 800 hours of pro bono work so far, because we are still going forward with this. The review has focused on gendered language. We've had two full sets of reviews, and now these documents are gonna be turned over to law experts in fields of criminal law, childcare law, domestic law, property law, et cetera, for review. Final recommendations will be made to the North Carolina Bar Association. Potentially, these could be going back to our own North Carolina General Assembly. It's a big project. Arizona has completed similar work, uh, and Illinois is in the process, and many other states are doing the same. So what can you do in North Carolina? Call and write your senators about SJR 1, Senate Joint Resolution 1, about removing the time limit. It's a symbolic gesture and it shows their support of women's equality. Talk to your legislatures about why North Carolina needs to be the 39th state to ratify. 1971 is when North Carolina ratified the 19th Amendment. Are, are, are we going to be another 50 plus years before we ratify the Equal Rights Amendment? and ask them to urge the Rules Committee to bring these bills to the floor for a vote. Talk to your friends and family. We find that a lot of people really don't know what the Equal Rights Amendment is, or they think it's already been ratified, and they think women are protected in the US Constitution. And we know they're not. And here's why they should care. We urge you to become a member of the ERA-NC Alliance to keep abreast of important information and you can invite your county, your municipality, your organization to pass a resolution in support of the ERA. That information is available on our website, shows you how to do it. And it's really showing that the people of North Carolina want to see the state and its citizens have full equality under the constitution. Remember, 4.2 million women live in North Carolina and zero women have equal rights. On behalf of the ERA-NC Alliance, I'd like to thank you for listening to this talk.